Hi everybody, so um, let's continue. Okay, so today we continue from yesterday the linear dynamical system stuff. And in fact, I had the, have the, uh, the, the good situation that I can use things from, from the lecture of uh, Felix yesterday because he handled this uh, linear uh, dynamical system and we have a look at the optimality system. Then we turn to linear elliptic PDEs so optimization of linear elliptic PDEs, their functional analysis comes into play. And then the combination of one and two is then the heat equation. So the idea is that I want to explain how to do PDE constraint optimization for elliptic and for parabolic equation and show you that for easy examples so that you can follow and have some idea how you can maybe proceed if you don't have the heat equation, but if you have also convection term and of course, going to the nonlinear stuff is following more or less the same way, but you need more analysis to work through. Okay? So, let's start. Okay, so we had this problem yesterday. Maybe you remember a bit. I try also to do. So, okay. So, we have a quadratic cost. We have this linear system A, B, matrices, Q, matrix, R, a matrix, R positive definite, Q positi positive definite semi-definite and it is positive definite on the kernel of this A, we have this, uh, yeah, that's it. Um, then the idea is we want to write this problem in an abstract form, no? in this form here. So, so I have here this equality constraint and the equality constraint should describe what happens here in this ODE system. And the idea is then to introduce this mapping this operator with two components because I have two equations here. The first one is this here, which is nothing else but putting the right hand side to the left. So the differential equation and the second one is the initial condition. So initial condition is then in Rn, so this area all lives in Z, so it's in Rn, the second component. And the first one I write in L20 Rn. So it is a vector, so this is an equation with n components and if I formulate it in this way means I suppose that the ordinary differential equation is satisfied for almost all t. No? So it's some kind of weak formulation. Then y dot, this guy lives in H1. No? So that is uh, my space for this y, for the, for the state variable. And also, let's also here, no? the x is now split in y and u. That is typical for these problems that we have a splitting of the optimization variable. Okay, and then I can write it like this. And why I'm doing this? I'm doing this because I want to apply this Lagrangian framework, set up the Lagrangian, deriving formally the uh, first order conditions, and from there get an idea how to compute solutions. Now, as we learned yesterday, and maybe also from school, you need this calculus to compute existence of solutions. All these proofs only use minimizing sequence and don't give you an idea how to compute. So we need this optimality condition. So that therefore, that's the idea that I've write it in this abstract form, okay? So, in our case, linear, cis, linear ODE, quadratic cost, this is, a, this is a quadratic problem. So there's a unique solution of this problem. So from the, okay, it does not follow ex only from the convexity, but in this case, everything is from linear and quadratic cost. You get that there is, exists a unique solution. And here the spaces. So that state y lives in this space. So for each t, you have a vector y of t, and this guy lives in h1, 0 t. Yeah? So it's this. So, uh, and the second one is the control. The control is on the right-hand side, this b u. This is a vector living with um, here should be an M, sorry. Here should be an M, so M uh, inputs for any time. And also there, this L2 uh, shows you we have this almost, for almost all T formulation. So Lagrangian. Lagrangian first term is cost. Right? This is just the quadratic cost. And the second one here is this E of X, E of X in a, a, a E of X in uh, the uh, inner product with this p variable. We had this yesterday and I wrote here this, I'll be a bit faster here because we had this yesterday. This is the Lagrangian. You see we have two Lagrange multipliers because we have two constraints. The number of constraints corresponds to the number 
of uh, Lagrange multipliers. And if you look there, you also see this is here the weak form. This is the weak form of the ordinary differential equation. So if this guy is equal to zero, means that this here is equal to zero for almost all t. No, that is behind these formulations. Okay, and there you see it's good to have that we are Hilbert spaces, so inner product, and uh, we can argue, argue from there. Optimality conditions in that case are as in the finite dimensional setting. So we have to compute derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the state, to the control, and to the adjoint. And the idea is then that we do this formally and then try to see what comes out, what are the equations, because this is only an abstract stuff. No? From there you don't see how to put it in a computer. No? So first we have to check what is this Ly, what is this Lu, and what is this Lp. And you see I'm starting from the end because that is the easiest part. This is the derivative with respect to the to p. And um, hmm. uh, da, da, da. I think that is fine. I said it also yesterday. So keep in mind, now derivatives are functionals. Now the spaces are infinite dimensional. So we have to say what kind of derivative we are doing. So in the first step, what you do, and that is how you compute now, on a sheet of paper, or maybe you need two, that's no problem. Now. So it's what is this guy, LP, u bar, uh, y bar, u bar, p bar, p. Okay, what is this? Okay, this is, so I go with the directional derivative. Okay, so it is lim epsilon goes to zero. And then I have this L at y bar, u bar, and now derivative with respect to p, p bar plus epsilon p, the direction. P is the direction, okay? Minus L of U bar P bar. So, no? and on the right hand side, you, you start with this. You have the formula for L. No? It's in the one, two, third, fourth line. You compute this guy, compute this guy. You look at the difference and you turn alpha goes to zero. And I don't want to do this in detail, but just so you see what is the calculation you have to do. And what you get is that what you here see here on the right hand side. So just look at this cost functional. There's no P. There's no Lagrange multiplier. So derivative of this guy is zero. No? And look at the other stuff. No? You only have the P here linearly. And you only have it here. So which means when you have a linear stuff and you differentiate it, you just get the direction. And that is what you see here. You see here the direction P1, which is the first component of this guy, of this, sorry, bar. Of this guy, of the direction. And the P2, which is the second component of this guy. Yeah? So you get this. And this is equal to zero. So which means this is equal to zero. But this means, because these are arbitrary of direction, you can choose P2 also to zero, you can choose P1 equal to zero. So which means this should be zero and this should be zero. And here this should be zero means again that this guy is equal to zero for almost all T, which is nothing else but the differential equation. And here you get the initial condition. When you have done this two, four, six times, then you recognize every time. Derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the Lagrange multiplier gives you the state equation, gives you this E of x, or the constraint, E of x is equal to zero. And that is what we see. Of course, a solution should satisfy the ordinary differential equation because it is a solution satisfying the constraint. So at the moment, everything is cool. No? So that is something we expect. But what about the other guys? What is L with respect to y? And what is L with respect to u? And the most thing we have to do is with this L with respect to Y. So the derivative with respect to the state variable. Okay. And this, in fact, you see it, and this leads to the so-called adjoint or dual equation. Sometimes also the state equation is called the primal equation because this is really the equation you are looking at. That is your constraint, the primal uh, equation. 
And the dual ex equation is something which helps you to compute. We said it also for the finite uh, dimensional optimization. The Lagrange multiplier is something which you don't see at the beginning. There was a minimization problem and there's only x. The Lagrange multiplier comes into play as a variable which helps to compute. It's an additional variable, so there is this dual equation. And you see also why, why it is called a joint. That is also comes out here. Okay. First line is just, if I did it correctly, just the Lagrange function again to see when we do the derivatives that what's going on, okay? So what have we have to do is we have this guy in this y prime. Why is this state space h10 t r n? So where the state lives, no? Okay. So we have to compute this. This guy equal in this function space, in this dual space, for all test function, this guy should be zero. And so we have to compute this guy here, which is equal to zero, that we see from here, from this, what has happened here. So derivative with respect to y. What is clear? All terms where we don't have any y, they disappear. No? They go for a coffee or whatever. No? So you don't have this guy. You don't have this guy. Yeah? And then what you see, okay, there's a quadratic term. We know this guy is symmetric, and we have this one half. So computing the derivative is something like direction y transpose q y bar plus, and then product the rule. No? Then you have y bar q and the, di and the direction y. And this together with this r one half gives you the first term that is exactly this. That's the derivative of the quadratic term. No, no u term, okay, we already discussed. And we saw from here we have only this guy, but this is linear. No? Also the derivative, this is a linear operator, this is a linear matrix, this is a matrix, so linear, so we get nothing else but the same operator, d dt minus a times direction. So that is this guy what we have here. p bar is just from there. And of course, computing the derivative here, this is a constant. Y bar is a data, it's initial condition, it's fixed. It does not depend on the state. Okay, it's zero. And here, this is linear. So you get the direction at zero, and we have this guy. Okay. Hmm. I'm not so satisfied with this. No? So why is the direction? So why is like the test function? No? For all test functions in this space H10 T R N, no? so long space, okay? But looking here, I see there are derivatives also of the, of, the, of the test function. So I would like to get rid of this dot. Okay, what you do is, okay, you want to do partial integration. And yesterday, they, Felix did it. But there's one step. Formally, okay, you can go for this. From the function analytic point, you have to be careful. This is my space, this is my space of the test function. Okay, look here. So the first component is only in L2. It's not in H1. So if, if it's only in L2, it's not clear what is P1 bar point. Huh? Okay, what you do in that case is, and that is Felix mentioned it, you need, you need something from variational calculus, okay? So you have that the equation holds for all y in some space. That means also it holds for all y in a subspace of this y, of this h1, which gives you the chance to argue over distributional derivatives. That is the idea. And that is what I see here. Aha, I take the C-infinity functions with compact support. And when you remember a bit this PDE stuff, weak derivatives, then it is exactly this kind of of Schwarz spaces where you are work with, and then you try to define what is the distributive, what is the distributive derivative? I think that's right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah? So, and that is what I did here. So I say this guy here, yeah, this guy, this is this kind of derivative which is de defined when I take this space, and then the idea is this guy, this space is a subspace of this, and it's a subspace of this, and even more, they are dense, which means any, argue, any element here, you can approximate by a sequence in this space, which converges in the norm of y to this element. And that is what we use now. Okay, so I did this, 
in the next line I put it here so I say okay where's my equation here I have this guy here and this guy this I replaced by now the dot is with p1 and we have the test function here then you see we have this a y transpose p1 bar but this can also be written no, so this is nothing else but y transpose a transpose b1 bar this is a scalar so you can transpose it. In fact, what you get is exactly this here. So you get this A transpose B one bar, but now I see, ha, now I can put these test functions on the right, as we usually have, no, ba, 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 times phi for all phi in the test space, okay? The test space at currently is here, but now I say, as I had this, this is a space which is densely embedded in this one. So I know that this equation holds not only here, but also in this space. But this means I can say that this guy here is in this space. And from there I see that the p bar 1, that is the p, p bar 1 dot, is well defined in L2, and I get additional regularity. Now my adjoint, which starts here, in this space, so p1 is in this, from this calculus I see, hey, it's even more. It's in H1. But this comes due to the optimality conditions. So you get extra regularity due to the constraint, due to this optimality condition. So we have that you know, this guy is in L2, but this means when you don't have the dot here, this means that P1 bar must be in H1. Okay. Now we have this equation. So this is also, by the way, you know, we see here's a differential equation. You know? It makes us a bit nervous, this minus sign, so it runs backward in time. Mm, I would have a problem usually with this equation if I have at zero some initial condition. It's not clear that I end up with this initial condition. Okay, so we have to fix what's going on, that it is hopefully a well-defined problem. But anyway, we see that it is a differential equation. And here you have this AT, this kind of transpose, and that is also why you, when you're doing this integration by part, this kind of transpose is also a reason that we call this a, a joint equation. Uh, a joint means something like the transpose of the matrix. No? Okay, so what now we do, okay, this is here. We checked it for this, this special no, uh, under function, but now I go back. I go back to this equation and say, okay, this equation holds not only for this subspace, also not only for this subspace, it even holds in this space H1. Now ah, there's H1, uh, this H1 space. It holds for this. Okay, and what I now do, because I can do integration by parts, we have additional regularity, I just do my calculation. So I take this here, do integration by parts, but now I get integration by parts gives you a boundary term. A boundary term with respect to the time, because we do integration by parts with respect to the t variable. Okay, so we get this guy here, and of course we have this guy from here, and the rest vanishes because the rest is then nothing else but this is equal to zero. So it's, it's exactly this term and we know this is zero from this computation. Okay, that is the idea. Okay, and now you can play here also by variational arguments that you say, okay, this holds for all functions y. So let's keep, let's take some which are equal zero at t equals zero, and let's take others which are equal zero at capital T equals zero. And from this you see, let's start with a capital Z, T, no? so which means uh, with, with, with T equals zero, so okay, we only have the term Y, <coughs> we have this zero is equal, and now I have this boundary term, I have Y capital T transpose P one bar of T, plus the zero term, t equals zero, is zero, and the, the term y zero transpose p two is also zero. So I choose specific test functions to get rid, to, to, def, uh, to, to let's say, uh, to um, get in information what happens for t equals zero and what happens for t equals uh, capital T. Because it holds for all test functions, so it should also be for specific ones, okay? Yeah, okay, but here you get, ah, I have not an initial condition for P1 bar, I have a terminal condition. Aha, it's a back running, a running equation, but I start at T equal to, uh, capital T and I have an initial condition, which is in this case 
zero. And the other one, if you only go for, for elements which are equal zero for T equal capital T, but not equal zero for T equal zero, then of course you get zero is equal, this term is zero because I choose the test function of this, but then I get this Y of zero transpose P one of zero, first term, and then I also have this plus Y of zero transpose P two. Aha, I solve the adjoint equation for P1 bar starting at capital T, run through my ODE, get a solution at capital T, at, at capital T, at, at, at zero. So I run from capital T backward no, to zero. So this guy is known and from this I can determine what is P2 bar. So the derivative with respect to y of the Lagrangian gives you equations how to get p1 bar, p2 bar, or to get the adjoints. Okay? The state comes from the, the state variable comes from the state equation. The adjoint variable it comes from the derivative with respect to y. But of course, there's still something missing. In the state variable, there is the optimal control that I don't have. And for that, of course we should use the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to u to get a further equation and then it's a coupled system and we can compute from there everything. No? Um, yeah, no? so again now the, the uh, Lagrange function and now I look for this guy, derivative with respect to the control. There are not too many terms, look at the, at the Lagrangian, no u, so disappear, no u, no u, ah, there's a u, okay, no u. So there's only this term, the quadratic term, and there's only this term where I have this, this differential equation and how the input, how the control enters the equation, this b u, okay? So, and if you compute the derivative, so using similar techniques like this, you exactly get for the quadratic term this guy, and this comes from, from derivative here, no? because you have this u bar is replaced by u, and then also you put the, you do this transpose to get the u as a test function on the right, so it's, it's something, take a sheet of paper and then you see it's, it's coming out there, no? so that is what you get. Okay, in our case, because r is invertible, you get exactly a formula for u bar, no, in this case. So you can also use it to replace u bar in the state equation and that we have also seen yesterday, there's only the state equation, no u is involved, but p was there. And then there was the joint equation. So it's, it comes from something what we had seen yesterday, okay? Hopefully you get a better picture now. And here again, so you have the state equation, which is an ODE, you have the initial condition for that. We have the joint equation backward running, but here's the initial condition. If you solve this, you know what is P2 bar, but in fact, numerical, this is not really needed. It's an additional var variable. If you, have, if you have the solution Y bar, U bar, P, P1 bar, you are happy because the solution of the optimal control problem is exactly this pair. No? The joint variable can be used for different things like sensitivity analysis, but this is a different story and maybe part three next time in Lumini or whatever. Okay? State equation, a joint equation, and often the inner term is optimality condition, but some people also say the, the coupled system is some kind of optimality condition, first order optimality condition, okay. Yeah. We should not uh, be disturbed or by these names, no? but this is usually, we had also exactly this, these names yesterday in the talk of the week. Okay, good. Ready for more stuff. So let's go for linear elliptic. So now we are in this PDE stuff, no? okay but no time dependence, only the spatial variable. All spaces are only depending on the domain, on the spatial domain, which is omega. Okay, let's take this Neumann problem here, yeah? Controllers on the right-hand side, we have this Neumann operator, so Laplacian plus Y, the constant term, we have uh, Neumann boundary conditions, so this is my PDE. So I want to influence the solution Y by, by this U, this is my control, my input, in such a way that the solution minimizes this cost. So forget the last term, then I would like to be very close to the yd. And the second term, the last term, of course, is something like, okay, 
I don't want it to do it without looking for the energy I put in the system. So U should not be too large. No? So because if U is large, then this term is large, this is maybe not a minimum. So it should be balanced and there's still this sigma which gives you the chance to balance. And then yesterday I also mentioned it is more like an, uh, a multi-criteria optimization problem and what you are doing there is nothing else but the so-called weighted sum method where you sum all cost functionals and you put a, a parameter sigma and that is, uh, th that is the idea. But this is also a different story, but this is more the, the theory behind maybe. Okay, how to set up the operator? Yeah, to get again this abstract formulation and go for the, op for the optimality condition. Okay, so if you have this E of x, this is defined. Okay, let's have a look. So it's from x to v star. Well, what is this v prime? v is, okay, the solution space. Okay, we are discussing weak solutions, h1. Now we are interested in a weak solution. So the solution space is this guy, and of course the, a, a joint, uh, the, the, the prime, the dual space is nothing else but h1 omega prime. What is this x? So I will have a look, this x, is it written? Yeah, this is v times u. Ah, okay, we have this pair. x is equal y and u. y is the state, y is in h1, and the control on the right-hand side, I suppose it's in L2. Take care, everything are Hilbert spaces. That is an essential point here. No? Okay. Then define this operator in such a way that you know from weak formulation. Yeah? Look at this guy here. Okay? If you set this guy equal to zero, you get exactly this. So you put this term on the other side, you get this. This is nothing else but the weak formulation of this here. No? And now you see that this is the idea that I go for this Neumann boundary conditions. If I take Dirichlet conditions, then you have additional equations. Sometimes you can put them in the space, but if they are non, if they are not homogeneous, then you have to take care, then you get additional constraints. And okay, technical stuff. The idea here is how to enter this field. Okay, so let's try to do use this natural boundary conditions. Natural also means here they can directly be included in the variational form. We only have one equation for E. There's not an E1 and A2 at the moment. We only have E is now equal this guy. If E is equal this V, uh, equal zero in V prime, this means that this guy is equal zero for all test functions, but this is nothing else but the weak formulation. And so I have here the operate at the abstract formulation of minimize this cost functional, often it's called the tracking type cost function because you want to track y to yd, such that the weak formulation of this elliptic PDE is satisfied. Okay, super. Again, the problem, no? now I've written this, not this E, so that you see more the structure of the specific problem we have in mind. And now what you can do is, that is often done in, in optimal control, that you introduce a solution operator because we have a specific solution, a specific um, property which we have not used in the finite dimensional stuff. In the finite dimension, it's more general. So we have this x variable. It, be, 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 it consists in two pair, in a pair, so y and u. And what we get from this equation, but also from the ODE, is for each fixed u, there exists a unique solution. So if you know u, y is given. So in some sense, y is a dependent variable of u. You can get rid of this. You can ri get rid of this, and this is done by this formulation that you say, okay, y is a function of u. I have here some operator, some solution operator. We saw it also already. So there's a solution operator. Give me the control. I solve the equation, so this weak formulation, then I get the state. And if I put this in the, in the equality constraints, I have exactly this. But if I know that this is already the unique solution, so this is equal to zero, so the constraints are automatically satisfied. Okay. And then the problem is just, okay, I take a, a cost function, a so-called reduced cost function. It's only defined in the control, but now the pair here is only state of u and u, so the, 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 the variable is only the u, and so my optimization problem is like this. Looks easier. No? It's an unconstrained problem. What is the optimality condition? Gradient equal to zero, also in the infinite dimensional setting. What is the problem? Usually everything what is makes things easier comes with some 
bad news. The derivative is much more involved. When you compute the gradient of this guys, you get inner derivatives. Y of u is a function of u has also to be uh, computed. Okay, it can be done, but just I want to show that computing the derivatives is not an easy task. At the end, you see you don't earn much. It's only more dependent on, for example, the number of unknowns. Here, u is also very big. Think of this, uh, of an example where u is only a boundary control, lives only on the boundary, so you don't have so many points like y, which is in the whole domain, three-dimensional domain or whatever. Then it's better to consider this problem because u is low-dimensional and you get, especially when you go for optimization methods, it's better to have this low-dimensional u and the uh, evaluation. But it depends. Sometimes it also depends what is available in your group. Now, if they are trained with this reduced cost functional, you stay with that because maybe they have algorithms available if you don't have this, then you have to implement everything from, this, from the beginning, okay. Good, existence, I don't want to go much into detail, just put out, uh, let's say, um, put some attention to things which are interesting. So we have this reduced cost functional here. S is in our case a linear and bounded operator because this Neumann problem is fine. You can bound the solution for every U, everything is fine. Ne? From this, usually, you can argue taking minimizing sequence. But the essential point is now, remember the finite dimensional case. We have, we, we look for the bounds of the control. So we have the sequence in U, N, and we want to have bounds. In our case, now, U is a variable in a Hilbert space. So what you only get is weak convergence of a subsequence. Right? So we have to have this weak convergence stuff. And going to the limit in the cost functional is now a little bit more delicate because you need that there is continuity with respect to the weak topology. Of course, you can play a bit. In fact, you only need this kind of condition, so weakly lower semi-continuity, which is satisfied for norms. But if you have a different cost functional, take care at that step. The other point, we had this question yesterday. Why this, this uh, control sequence is bounded? This is only due to the fact because we have this term. It comes not from this. Definitely comes not from, here's only an L2, uh, L2 norm, not an H1. So the boundedness comes from this, which means if sigma is equal to zero, nothing works. Sometimes you see optimization problems where they have sigma equal to zero, but then take care, maybe they have the U belongs to a subset and this subset is bounded. Then of course you can argue from there. Suppose you have lower and bow, uh, upper bounds for the control, then from there you get also that the sequence is bounded. But if you don't have constraints on the control and you don't have this, this term here, it may happen that u runs to infinity in the norm in order to get a y which is very close to the yd. It's not clear from the mathematical point, just to have this. No? Okay, so funny, no? I, I like this, so that they will play with this function analysis and the PDE world and the optimization, so okay. Yeah, um, optimality conditions. Yeah, the same as, and that is, now we can play the machinery. Yeah, again, okay, you, we have to check this regularity, but as a, pr a present for today, it's done. You can check that there exists Lagrange multiplier satisfying this, this con uh, condition here, okay? So we, again, it looks like in the previous case, we don't see the elliptic PDE here. It's abstract, we have the Lagrangian and the derivative. This is y, u, and p. It looks like for the ODE case. Well, you don't see the structure here anymore. But of course, when do we see the structure? When we compute these derivatives. And we hope that then the structure comes into play and we get, what do we expect? State equation, optimality condition, a joint equation. Okay, and that happens. That happens. So, again, as in the previous, we, Compute the derivative with respect to the p variable, the adjoint. What do we know already? We expect that we get the state equation. The derivative with respect to the Lagrange multiplier. Uh, uh, look at this guy. Compute the derivative with respect to p. There's no p, there's no p. You only have it here. So p bar, all, everything is linear. You just get this guy, this guy is equal to this, and you see hey, that this is a weak formulation. This equals zero is nothing else but the weak formulation of this, okay? Take a time to read. If you are not in this business, it's clear that, that maybe you're, but follow this, uh, this idea, what we have also for the previous 
application. So it's, it's, you get the state equation, you get the constraint, E of x is equal zero. That is what you get from the p derivatives. Huh? Then it's also interesting, okay, we know there is this solution operator, okay? So if you have the u, this y of u is nothing else but the solution of the state equation for this given u, then you see that this guy here, this guy, uh, we infer from this guy is equal zero. That is what we have solved here. And this is equal, no, vice versa. So that is not. The derivative of this guy here is, is this, okay? If instead of the y bar, you plug in this guy, which means the solution, exact solution to that, it's also clear that this term disappears. So what happens is this guy is also zero. We will need it later. We will need that, okay? So the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the adjoint is equal to zero when I plug in here the exact solution or the weak solution to the u I have here. And it, it, it comes directly from this guy should be zero because y of u is the weak solution of the problem. So this is equal to zero. Okay, just keep in mind that this guy is, we, we come to that later. It's not, uh, okay, continue optimality condition. P, y, what is happens when we compute the derivatives to y? Okay, let's check. No u term, u terms cancels out. We only have this term, okay, quadratic. This gives you this. Right? It's like this, two times, ah, there's a half missing. There's a half in front of that. So, so one times one half, this guy times direction is this. Here we have also, here everything is linear. So the y bar has to be replaced by the direction. Here's y and here we have the y bar direction here. Okay, from here to here I just change, there's no partial integration, I just change the ordering. It's nothing, that, it's not, no, 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 no mathematical stuff I'm applying here, just change the ordering. So this is the same than this. This is the same than this, and this I put here. And now you see, okay, this guy equal to this. This is also a weak formulation of an elliptic PDE. This is again a formulation of the elliptic PDE. And if you look for this first beginning part here, it is very similar to the, not it's so very similar, it's the same as for the state equation. In fact, it turns out after some, when you say, it's nothing else but this. Take this and derive the weak formulation for that equation it's exactly this equal to zero. And so this equation here is then the adjoint equation. In this case, we see that we get more or less the same differential operator, but the but is behind is that the differential operator, the elliptic operator is symmetric. And therefore the transpose is the operator itself. So here we don't see this adjoint, right? because it's the same. If you have an evection term, it would be different, okay? Okay, this here is again the weak formulation. Look at this here equal to zero, but instead of this p bar, I take the p which responds to the control u. What do I mean with this? Aha, there is this, there is this y here. No? So here, I can plug in not some y here, but I can plug in the y which corresponds to a given control. Give me a control, I solve the state equation, I put this in here, this gives me a right hand side, and I solve the adjoint equation. And I see this is equal to zero. Also here we get some information for the Lagrangian. If you don't get it now, it's not a problem. This is not the major point. But what I want to say is here that we get some, some equations for the Lagrangian. Okay. Derivative with respect to u. Okay. We have this is the Lagrangian. With respect to u is only this term and is only this term. Okay. Here's the quadratic term. What you get is exactly this. Sigma times u bar times direction. And the, this term is linear in u bar, so in u. So u bar p goes to directions times b bar. This is optimality condition equal to zero. So this guy is equal to zero. You can write this in this form. So u is like a test function here. And now you also recognize this is nothing else but an L2 inner product. You can write it like this. Aha, okay. So that is interesting what you see here. So you see that here's some guy living in the space u, whereas here you have this functional defined in u bar. Now in this case, you can write it in this form that you can replace this by, let's say, there's something like, like you're in the direction of Reese theorem, that you see this guy is nothing else but the Reese representant of this derivative here in front. 
Okay, but this means equal to zero means this guy is equal to zero and this is nothing else but this. Again, we get the formula for the control. Now remember in the previous case, u is equal, there was also this one over sigma, then there was this r inverse, and that is what you get also that is here. There's no r because we don't have this r here with the, with the u, and we don't have a b in front of this guy here, so therefore this formula here seems a bit easier. But again, you can do this, take the state equation and replace u bar by this formula, and then you take the joint equation and you are, you are ready. And as I said here now, from this you also see that the, 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 the gradient can be written by this. And gradient, I mean the least representant of this guy here. This is important in the application when you go with numerical app to, uh, methods, like gradient method. Then it's like this, you add in the iteration uk. The next is uk minus step size times the derivative. No, that is what you learn, no, the steepest descent method. But u is a function, and the derivative is a functional. So what you need there is definitely the function, so the least representant. So that is something you have to do in the computation. Here you don't see it much, but you should take care in the computation when you do finite element approximation. It's important that you need really the function in u, which is then the gradient minus gradient, which is added to the current uh, control. Okay, but this is just an outlook. No? Okay. What is nice, I don't want to come uh, go into detail here, what is nice is that the cost functional, as this is a so-called reduced cost functional, eh, where we in, include the constraint in the formulation of the reduced uh, cost functional, that the derivative can now be computed, da, 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 no, so can be computed in such a way that this guy is equal to, to the, only to this, and at the end, you get that the gradient, what is used in, in numerical schemes, the gradient is nothing else but this sigma u times minus p u. So you get exactly this, this property. And you see, that is what I, the details, maybe you, you have access to these slides and you can look at this if you want to do more on the PDE constraint optimization side. But what I want to say here is, is also coming back, full problem, reduced problem, okay? Computing the derivative, this gradient here, what does it mean? It means, okay, sigma u is easy, but it means to compute pu. What is pu? Means you take the u, you solve the state equation, you get y of u, and then you put in the y of u on the right-hand side of the joint, and you get the joint. So in fact, you have, again, the coupled system. So also with the reduced ansatz, you have to solve the state and the joint to get the gradient. It's, you don't earn much. So they are equivalent, of course, and so you have to do the work, no? of course. Okay, here again I have this, no? the system, no? a state equation, and so on, uh, optimalities, uh, conditions, a joint, um, and uh, you can do the reduction, okay. So I have one minute for the heat equation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, now, um, what, is, what I should do is this, okay? So what I, I had in mind was to do with you here this, this problem. So the same cost functional, the same cost functional, but now I have also an integral over the time, and I have the heat equation control on the right-hand side, so similar to the previous one, I have Neumann here, but now I have also the initial condition. And what I want to point out is then you follow again the same ideas by mixing both. Okay, what do I mean mixing? Just I put in these things. I also want to get this to go for the optimality system. What is this now? Okay, as for the elliptic case, this can be put in a weak formulation and you see it here. This is a weak formulation for the, of the heat equation. Time derivative, here's the Laplacian, the weak formulation. We have the u phi which comes from here. So that is the weak formulation of the heat equation. But as for the ODE case, we now have an initial condition, and this gives you an E2. So similar as for the, um, for the ODE case, you have a second component. So, so the analysis is mixing now both things, because you have like the elliptic weak formulation and you have the initial condition. So you think, okay, maybe I'm a bit prepared. Yes, you are. Yeah? So <laughs> what is then, the, okay, this is the reduction. So what I wanted to say is, this things, yeah. Ne? You have this optimality system, and then you go again with the calculus. So you have this is now a bit longer, but as in the ODE case, you have this term, 
And as in the PDE case, you have this plus the time derivative. So it's very similar. Everything is linear. So the analysis is really similar. Derivatives with respect to P gives you the Weeks formulation of the heat equation. Huh? Derivative of this gives you the coupling between U and P. And derivative with respect to Y gives you the adjoint equation. No, you are in the position you can give it now to students in the master. If they learn something, they can do it. You expect already some result. No? Okay, is it this what you expect? Um, yeah, here's the optimality system. Yes, what would you expect? Derivative with respect to P gives you the state equation. Okay, the optimality system is okay. Here is the heat equation. Ah, here I already see that there is this connection between U and P, one. Like in the inner operation. Okay, it's replaced here. We have the reduced system here. And this is the adjoint equation. And what you see is, okay, like in this elliptic case, there is the same uh, operator here. Oh, there's one error. We don't have this term. Okay, but the same here. This is the symmetry. But here, ah, this is also from the ODE case. The adjoint equation is now running backward in time. That is also what you would expect from the ODE case. What happens for the UDE is exactly also valid for the PDE case. Okay? So forward heat equation, backward adjoint equation. Again, everything is fine because the backward heat equation is usually ill posed. No? It's running backward when you have the initial condition at zero. Mm, does not work. But again, we have this condition here, and you have the adjoint equation. The optimality condition is coupling here. So you can also go for U bar here and solve the, the coupled system which in this case, for example, can also be done by the favorite CG method. It's a convex problem, linear, quadratic cost. So CG method is usually the best you can do here because you know that it is very fast convergent. Gradient method is not so meaningful because it's not using this convex structure this, uh, and the linear quadratic functional behind. No? I think that's it. Please apologize that we are, there is some analysis for the heat equation in between, but I know it also from attending lectures. In fact, I started with this optimization in my PhD that probably you get an idea that it will work for the heat equation, but if I would do this in detail, it's maybe at the end too much and you need too much coffee to survive the day today. You know? And you want to have some energy also for, the, for your posters this evening. So. I enjoyed it very much. Hopefully you get something, some message, but you know, I'm around uh, and I'll, I'm happy if you have questions now, but also in the time after because it's already late.